Hello everyone, my name is Wayne Mingesha, Artistic Director of Soul Pepper Theatre, and it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce you to uh, Debi Young Nita Africa, the creator of Shimami Wata, which takes us to Jamaica in our around the world adventure. Hey Debi. Hi everybody. <laughs> 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 yes, thank you for sitting down and talking to us about this uh, about this piece and about this project as a whole. It looks at pieces that had a major cultural influence on storytelling practices. And this mm -hmm. one kind of is a reverse in that your piece actually uh, uses a lot of st cultural practices yeah. Um, yeah. that influenced you specifically growing up um, in Jamaica as a daughter of a theater practice practitioner and a dub poet. Yeah. Um, so many people so many people are responsible so many yeah and that's been a, a part of your work in general is this archiving um so talk to me about some of the um some of the practices that make up shimami wata absolutely the first person that comes to mind uh that i want to give a big shout out to is miss lou aka louis is Coverly Bennett. Um, Miss Lou is our celebrated, uh, we can call her a historian, storyteller, poet, performer, um, who went around Jamaica collecting pithy sayings and proverbs in the nation language, documented them, archived them so that people like me could grow up and study it. And I grew up watching her on TV telling stories. So I think of her sitting with young children around telling them stories in the the mixed tongue of Jamaica. You know, Jamaican is a mixture of West African languages that enslaved Africans brought in their bodies, in their mouths, and English, a bit of Spanish, a bit of French from the colonizers. I also think of my mother, Anita Stewart, and the dub poetry that I witnessed her and her contemporaries performing as I was growing up. So people like Amuta Baruka, people like Malachi, um, people like Tom Lynn, Ellis, Cherry Natural, Jean Binta Breeze, uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson, Ajizina Mandela in, in Canada. The, so this form, this dub poetry form where the poet, the writer, the artist is also an activist and is also a leader who takes on for themselves this responsibility of observing what is going on in the community, but not in, in, in absence of themselves. They're looking at what's happening in their own lives as well and creating this story, this narrative to illustrate to the community what's happening and the potential for social change. So I witnessed that growing up and dub poetry is highly musical as well. And then I think of African storytelling traditions that were syncretized with British pantomime traditions. I think of the pantomime that my mom took me to at the Ward Theater growing up and the ways in which these Anansi stories that were brought over from uh, Ghana with the Ashanti, Anansi stories and brother rabbit stories and brother snake stories and the ways that those stories were then mixed with British pantomime traditions to create our very unique style of Jamaican storytelling, Jamaican pantomime. So when I think of She Mami Wata, I'm really pulling from all those traditions, from the dub tradition, from the African storytelling traditions, from the pithy sayings and the proverbs, from um, the pantomime, and, and then creating this distilled version of solo performance that is musical, that has multiple characters that are fully developed and that is also political. The whole project does engage us in a bit of a political conversation just inherently in like what actually has colonization or, you know, how does it, um, how does it deem which iconic pieces uh, exist throughout history and what do we deem classic? And uh, I think that your piece specifically speaks to that, the effects of colonialism. Um, but also you had an interesting thought when we were talking about which piece from Jamaica and you, you've you been such a part of like, of championing, you know, the, the, the archiving and the history around this. But you mm -hmm. talked about like that has to be 
considered also when we're looking at a at, at a country that has experienced colonialization what are we looking mm -hmm. back to and what's actually coming specifically from the people versus exactly it's it's the, you know when i think of uh, jamaica but even expanded to the rest of the world we can't deny the impact that colonization has on shaping what we consider to be educational, um, what we consider to be a, a high standard, what we consider to be literature, what we consider to be theater. And so much of what is happening now is really the result of an ongoing tradition of resistance to colonization that really started from the moment the first person was stolen and put onto a ship. It's so incredible to acknowledge that the work that I'm doing is actually a contribution to a long lineage and legacy of work that has been going on for as long as we've been colonized. I think that that is really important to note. So within that tradition of resistance, in Jamaica, there is a tradition of what we could, could call post-colonial theater that speaks directly to being colonized. So when I think of She Mami Wata and how it fits into that tradition, it engages directly with colonization when it looks at the Bugri laws that were imported into Jamaica from the British constitution. We're talking 1835. These, these, these Bugri laws were, were imported into Jamaica as a part of fashioning a legal system grounded in colonization. And these Bugri laws particularly speak to um, men becoming intimate with other men and the punishment around that. Now, if you think of the kind of shaping that colonialism has had on all peoples all over the world, but in particular, African peoples, where we have internalized shadism, we've internalized casteism, we've internalized classism, we've internalized ideas of gender and sexuality. And I speak specifically about African peoples, Black peoples in Jamaica, because that is the experience that I had growing up. But I mean, we see globally that everyone is actually responding to the impact of colonization. In Shima Miwata, it was so important for me to not only look at the cultural ways in which we have been conditioned by colonization, but the ways in which the legal system still supports these colonial attitudes by having those laws on the books. So culturally, of course, being a neo-colonial society, Jamaica, homophobia exists in Jamaica to understand that homophobia was a part of what was imported, forced on the people by British imperialism. And so, of course, homophobia is a part of the reality, but so is also queerness, right? So queerness exists in Jamaica. And I really wanted to have an opportunity to speak to how queerness exists as a resistance movement to homophobic colonial systems that are still functioning and how the people on the ground navigate their intimacies, their sacrednesses, their love. Most importantly, their mm. love. How do they navigate their love through these oppressive systems that they're interrelating to every day, both institutionally, but also culturally and also socially in their neighborhoods, in their at work, at school. Um, and that's what the piece is really looking at. How do you navigate love within oppression? Mm -hmm. And I love this idea when we're talking about a continuum and we're investigating classics, uh, you know, that it's true. It's one of the pure things that was, that could never be um, controlled or broken is story, right? And it preserves and it, it is, uh, 
yeah, it's a be- it's a beautiful thing to think about. You can't break the story. You can't break you can't break it out of our out of us. It's and it's founded on stories. It's stories. It's stories. I heard this incredible uh, indigenous story maker speak one time, and the, I just remember him saying, "It's stories all the way down." Thomas, is it Thomas King? I don't remember. But I do remember this phrase, it's stories all the way down. And at the end of the day, no matter what systems are in place, we understand who we are through the stories that we tell each other. So there's always an opportunity to tell new stories and to refashion old stories. That still is the thing that gets me most excited about storytelling. And as Kevin Loring says, who's actually the the artistic director of um, Indigenous Storytelling, Indigenous Theater and National Arts Center, he says stories are, are our medicine. Yeah. And, yep. and that that they're still a part, that you are using this uh, as, a, as, as active healing yeah. um, for issues that are, are still quite active, right? Yeah. In the yeah. community and are threatening people's lives. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful work. You can hear the full play Shimamiwata at soulpepper.ca and you can do a deep dive on this play and some of the influences that to be spoke of when you listen to the podcast on CPC Ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much.